Ephesians 4, verses 14 through 16. So that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way unto him who is, is the head unto Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint which, with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, the body grows so that it builds itself up in love. Good morning. morning. It's good to see everyone that's able to be out with us. We do have some that are visiting. We're so thankful that you are here. The elders have asked me to to preach on a series on our worship and really the importance of all of us and the desire for all of us as the Lord's body to make sure we're giving the best that we possibly can in our service. What I think is interesting about various words is his body language if i said this about you know when you're talking to somebody we see body language you can see when somebody whether they want to be listening or not or if they're thinking about other things at the time you can see how people react to things we we understand body language well the reality is when we talk about god's church we're the body and how we act and how we grow and how we are united in our worship is so unbelievably important. And so what I want to do this morning is just kind of start the conversation about using 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, 13 and 14, if you'd like to open your Bibles there. And really look at what it looks like when it comes to our body language at West Mason and the part that I play that you play. In, our, in the body of Jesus Christ. The verses that were just read to us, the last verse, verse 16, Tyler talked about this last week, but it talks about from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joy supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And the idea for us and how I play a part and how you play a part in this body here at West Mason. And then certainly, obviously, in the big picture when we talk about the body of our Savior, the universal church, the part that we are all striving or hopefully are, are a part of as the Lord's body. Here at West Mason, there are parts that we all play. Some of them are easy to see. Some of us get up here. But they were all important. And I think that's so powerful, and hopefully it's something that we can understand as we go through this. In 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, 13th chapter, and the 14th chapter, the subject specifically is spiritual gifts. Obviously, I'm not up here today to talk about spiritual gifts. We're not talking about the things that they were able to do in the first century, the different things that they were given And how they were able to do various things and how it had become an issue for the brethren there. What I think is important as we go through these chapters, though, is that you see the principles of how we are to act towards one another. That was the issue. They had these amazing spiritual gifts. And I've talked about this before. What happened was the ones that could speak in tongues became the cool people. And those that could do the prophesying and the other things were kind of the... Are we allowed to say nerdy people still? I don't know what the rules are. Nerdy people. And Paul comes along and he says, look, we're all one. We've got to understand our role in all of this and the importance of all of this and the fact that every single person matters in the body. In 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, it talks about the beginning here, talking about the same spirit and the same God, and you'll see that talked about fairly often. This is God's plan. It's his body. It's his church. And why that is important is because we understand that it's not about me right off the bat. 
everyone matters. In verse 12, he says, For just as the body is one, and yet has many parts, all the parts of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit you are all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greeks, whether slave or free, and we are all made to drink that one Spirit. For the, one bo for the body is not one part, but many. If the foot says, Because I am not a hand, I am not part of the body, it is not for this reason any less part of the body. And if the ear says, Because I am not an eye, I am not part of the body, it is not for this reason any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? Listen to this verse. But God has arranged the parts, each one of them in the body, just as he desired. If they were all one part, where would the body be? But now there are many parts, but one body. We all are important, and we're all needed. Every single one of us are needed. First and foremost, because it's the commandment of our God. If we're striving to serve Him and have a relationship with Him, I'm going to do the best of my ability every time, every day of my life. But certainly while we're here, worshiping Him. When I sing songs, I'm going to sing songs, understanding the purpose of those songs. I think it's a valuable lesson for all of us to understand. There are different roles, certainly. But we all matter. We're all important. And we all have a role to play, whether you stand up here or not. It's so important for us to understand this part. You continue on here. He talks about the weaker part of the body in verse 22 and 23. I'm going to pick up in verse 24 in the middle of the verse. It says, But God has composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that part which lacked, so that there be no division in the body, but that the parts may be of the same care for one another. Excuse me, may have the same care for one another. And if one part of the body suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if a part is honored, all the parts rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body and individually parts of it. You are a part of God's body. That is an amazing thing to even be able to say. We are a part of His body. Up here, whether it's me standing up here or me never getting up here, I am a part of His body. And when I'm I at services and I'm doing my parts and the various things that I play or the different things that I do, it's not about me. It's about Him. And what I think is so important for us to understand this part is the significance that it plays whether you're sitting in a pew or if you're standing up. God knows your worship of Him. God knows your heart. God knows your motivation behind what we do. Whether you're standing up here or not. There's an importance for us to understand that this is His body. It's His plan. And there is a purpose as to why you are here. And I pray that we understand that purpose and that we have the attitude as we read in verse 25 and 26 again, that we care for one another. That we care for the one that we see standing up here, that we care for the one that never gets up here. We care for the one who sends cards, we care for those that are struggling. That we have the same attitude towards one another because we are part of His body. And it's about Him. The amazing thing about this as you go forward, is that that's exactly what the next chapter talks about. You know what the issue was for the people in Corinth? You're dealing with absolute spiritual gifts, these amazing things that they had. He tells them you're all a part of one body, whether you have prophesying ability, whether you're speaking in tongues, it doesn't matter. You're part of one body. There's a purpose for you here. And then he says in chapter 13, here's your issue. You've got to love one another. We need to love one another one another and verse 1 beginning says if I speak with the tongues of mankind and of angels but do not have love I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal 
If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give away all my possessions to charity, and if I surrender my body so that I may may glory but do not have love, it does me no good. So the question when we come up and we're doing things for our worship service, and we're doing our part, what is the motivation behind it? He says the people here had the spiritual gifts of speaking in tongues. They had the spiritual gift of prophecy. They were willing and able to sell all that they had. They were willing to be martyrs for the kingdom. And he says if they have lo- don't have love, it's nothing. It's nothing. What's my motivation? For those of us that are able or blessed to be up here, to come up here, what's my motivation for being up here? For people to see me? Oh, I hope not. People to hear me? See? That's not why we're here. I'm going to throw this thing away. That's not why we're here. But the temptation is very real. For people to think this is about me. Or about you. And certainly as we get into chapter 14, there's the encouragement and the edification that we are doing. There's no question about that. But when I come up front and I do the things that I'm doing up here, it's not because I'm some amazing person. Watch me walk. I used to call it when we talked about deacons and elders. It's not about waving in the parade. That sometimes can happen when we're walking up here. Look, at, look who has singing. Look who's preaching. That's not what it's about. Or the reason why I pick a song. Turn this one on, please. The reason why I pick a song or do the Lord's Supper. As Dwayne talked about, what are you going to say? The awesome thing for us is that God has given us a book of what to say. We don't have to add to it. We sing songs to help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. What does the song do? It helps prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. And then somebody gets up and talks. What's that supposed to do? Help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. When do we kick in that it's helping prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper? And it's not about me. It's about our Savior, what He's done for me. Or the songs that we sing. Do I sing my favorite songs because I like the way that they sound? When I pray, do I use words that are just big and I want to talk long because other people do? And this isn't something that I, it's a judging of other people for me. This is the motivation that I look at myself about. Why am I talking about this? Why do I get up here? And it can be a temptation for the motivation to be wrong. And God says here in these verses, verses 1, 2, and 3, the people that have the speaking in tongues, the people that have the gift of prophecy, they're going to lose their soul because they don't have love. Or is our motivation love? Do I sit in a church assembly because it's a checklist? Because that's what I'm supposed to do on Sunday? Or is it because I love God? Am I here to worship Him? Am I here to encourage others? This motivational piece steps on my toes first and foremost. I want to tell you. That's the difficulty sometimes in preaching. This can be a struggle for all of us. But it's a reminder of what this is really all about. And it is about me serving my part in the Lord's body. And making sure that we understand what that purpose is. And that's what's so fascinating to me about chapter 14. Chapter 14, and I said, this is just the first 
in a series of, of conversations we're going to have. But chapter 14 talks about this edification of our worship. What does our body language show when it comes to our edification of worship? When we sing songs of, to God, when you sing songs, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, what is the purpose of those things that we do? Are we striving to edify? Are we striving to praise God? This whole chapter is about what he expected on his worship. He talks about the gifts again, of course. But he begins by saying, Pursue love, yet earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For the one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for edification, exhortation, and consolation. The one who speaks in tongues edifies himself, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. And the interesting thing, if you continue on here, or as you continue on here, is the use of the term edification and the edifying of the church. Edifying of the church. What's the purpose? It's to edify the church. That's the purpose. It's to continue to help one another grow in our worship of our God, in our relationship with our God, to the point that he goes on, and again, talking of spiritual gifts, and obviously the point that is being used here, but I just want you to see the attitude and the principle of this. In verse 6, he says, But now, brothers and sisters, I have come to you, if, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation or of knowledge or of prophecy or of teaching? Yet even lifeless instruments, whether flute or harp, and producing a sound, if they do not receive a distinction in the tones, how will it be known what is played on the flute or on the harp? For if the trumpet produces an indistinct sound, so you will, who will prepare himself for battle? So you too, unless you produce in intelligible speech by the tongue, how will you be known what is spoken? Or how will it be known what is spoken? For you will just be talking to the air. What an interesting phrase that is. Chapter 14. Is my desire to bring edification to others? Is that my goal? Am I striving to help other people in my worship of my God? In the way that I sing when I'm sitting? The way that I partake of the Lord's Supper? The way that I pray? The way that I preach? The way that I treat other people? Am I showing love? Am I pursuing love? Am I striving to edify one another? What is the motivation behind what, am I, what I'm doing? Is it my desire to edify other people? It's a powerful lesson to understand this responsibility that we have as God's church. You'll hear people from time to time talk about, I was not encouraged today. There's a reality of that conversation that you can have. But I think more importantly, the question that we need to start asking my, ourselves is, did I encourage other people? Did I edify others? Did I do my part in the body as I worshiped my God today? I think that's the better, more mature perspective for us to have. Paul says, look, speaking in tongues is important. God gave that for a reason. But you're edifying yourself. Edify the church. Is what he's going on and talks about. And continue on in verse 12. So you too, since you are eager to possess spiritual gifts, strive to excel for the edification of the church. That is the point. That was the point in the first century, and it's the same point today. That's the principle that we are striving to have. I want you to notice what he goes on and says here in verse 13. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue is to pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unproductive. What is the outcome then? I will pray with the spirit, but I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit, but I also sing with the mind also. This reminds me from our perspective of John the fourth chapter. Am I worshiping him in spirit and in truth? Obviously, the context here is talking of spiritual gifts, but the point is the same. 
What is the purpose as to what I'm doing? If I'm talking over everybody's head so that nobody can understand a word I'm saying, why am I doing it? Is that to edify me? If I get up and pray and there's no thought behind what I'm doing, is it just words that are coming out and there's no intention? There's no mind part? When I'm singing songs, do I just sing them or do I pay attention to the words? That's the purpose. It's about our minds. It's about our whole being. It's about us edifying our God and doing all that we can. Or, and I love this phrase that is used in verse 9, you're just talking to the air. You're just talking to the air. If our hearts and our minds and our motivation is not where it's supposed to be, you're just talking to the air, he says. There's no purpose as to what you are doing. You're just going, as we make application to us, you're just going through the motions. It becomes about us, me, instead of about God. It becomes about edifying me only. And that's not the purpose. Can you imagine if we're all doing this? If we're all striving to encourage one another, you go back to 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. The reason why I did it this way is I want to come back and I want to read these verses that we read often. 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, is a beautiful, beautiful chapter. There is no question about that. But sometimes we can take it out of context. And I want you to really understand the context that this is written in. The spiritual gifts were an issue. They become, they become divisive over them. This whole book talks about the division that's occurred in various different ways. And then verse, chapter 13, we talked about verses 1 through 3, and he talks about the speaking, if I speak, if I have, and if I give, he talks about it. This is about me. I'm missing the point. And then he says in verse 4, Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. It does not act disgracefully. It does not seek its own benefit. It is not provoked. It does not keep an account of a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It keeps every confidence. It believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And then he goes back and talks about these gifts that they had. The one thing is God's body that we always need to understand is the motivation needs to be and has to be love. It has always been about love. Love for one another. Love for our God. So much so that God says, if you're going to say that you love me, you've got to love one another. You have to love one another. That's what the whole book of 1 John is talking about. You've got to love one another. And it's amazing to think about that God says in a very real sense how you worship will be an encouragement to other people. It can also be a discouragement to other people. We have a responsibility as God's children to make sure we are worshiping God the way that we should, but that we also are treating one another the way that we need to. That we are patient, that we are kind, to even the least. That we don't brag, that we don't become arrogant, that we don't make it about us. And that we understand that this is about God and our love for Him. One of the things that I think can happen very quickly is that we can kind of just get caught up in the routine of worship. I've been through that, and I'm probably not alone. It's just what we do. And sometimes we need to be reminded about why we are actually here. I love Hebrews, the 12th chapter, for this reason. There's a number of reasons, but Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 28, beginning, says, Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Your version, instead of service, may say worship. With reverence and awe. 
I don't know about you, but there are times where I don't think about his reverence and all enough. And I believe if we take this week and we continue to grow, all of us, me included, to really focus on why we come in to worship him and really think about how we need to revere him, how awesome he truly is. I believe that we will worship God the way that he wants us to worship him. Whether as leaders up here or all of us sitting in pews. That we will worship God the way that his body is to worship him. I pray that you have reverence for him. I pray that we worship him with a sense of awe every time. But I do pray that we all look in the mirror to make sure our motivation is what it needs to be. That we are worshiping the great God of all things. My Father. Your Father. And understand the responsibility that we have as His body. All of us do. The opportunity to be a part of His family certainly comes with responsibilities. But it comes with tremendous blessings. Blessings that we have here as his children and certainly in the life to come for eternity. If you have not obeyed the gospel and become part of his body, you have the opportunity now. We speak of this often. There are a lot of people that want to be saved. They want a savior. And I understand that. I appreciate that. But the understanding of the scriptures is he's not just going to save you. He's going to be your Lord. And if you're going to be a part of his body, you're going to follow the head. You're going to follow him. We're going to worship him the way that he deserves to be worshipped. And the way that he commands to be worshipped. If you have not become a part of this body... I encourage you today to do so. Understand what he was willing to do for you. Just to give you the choice to be a part of this body. As I said, if the Lord wills, next week we'll talk of more about this. But just begin to think about how you worship him. Your motivation behind it. And let's all strive to grow in this reverence and awe of him. In our day-to-day -day lives. If you have questions, ask. Let's ask. If you're doing these things, keep going. Keep growing. Keep doing those things. Excel still the more, as Paul would say. Let us continue to grow in our worship of him and our edification of one another. If there's anything that we can do for you, I ask you to please come as we stand and sing.